to do the impossible. Forgiveness is impossible without God in you. That just came to my mind listening to that song again. After service last week in Birmingham, given this message, that wise hoary head, Glenn Holliday. Glenn, I'm calling you out today in Huntsville. 92 year old, ordained in 1970 as a minister. He said to me, forgiveness is a godly trait. And I says, thank you, Glenn. There was two or three others standing there heard that. The message today is an overdue message. It's a message that I meant to have given around Passover because the subject of forgiveness is a Passover message. It's embedded in the heart and core of the Passover story. And I want to give that today, and it sits there in the center of the whole framework and core of salvation itself. It's a message that I said last week to the two congregations, if I get on your toes to touch your heart, so be it. Because I look around the church still, as I have all of my life, the body of Christ, and in honestly, honest appraisal of the church evaluation, I see still at times too many hardened hearts of unforgiveness. So I hope you have ears to hear today and more than that, a heart to receive it because your title of the sermon today is forgiveness to heal a heart. And it takes a forgiving spirit, God in us, to do the impossible, as the song said. We cannot of our carnal beings give forgiveness so much of the time when we've been hurt or transgressed against, and I think we all can readily identify with these things. How important and how needed is forgiveness? It's everything. It's everything. Again, it is at the core of the whole Passover story. And my little bit of an apology for not giving it when I wanted to around Passover. You know how other things kind of sometimes come into the mind. and But some things happened very recently that I thought I need to circle back and give this message about forgiveness. I wrote in my notes that forgiveness and that is a forgiving spirit that comes from God. It keeps God's spirit activated. It will activate and keep God's spirit activated within us. And it promotes a converted heart. It heals a heart. It helps to mend a heart that's been hurt, that's been wounded even. And I don't need to go into an array of scenarios about in your life, every one of us has been transgressed against. We've been hurt, each one of us. We've been mistreated at times, you name it, and some worse than others, and depends on the grievance that you've gone through. And you know when I say these things, and just as the song says, it is impossible almost to forgive, and is unless God and his spirit and his mind, his heart, is becoming our heart. As Glenn said, it's a godly attribute, and it has to be in place, or we cannot forgive on our own, and that is forgive any situation, every and any situation. So I want to speak continually about this today. I've got in my notes, where does forgiveness begin? Where does it start? Where does it begin? Well, it begins first with you and I, me between my God and my Savior, Jesus Christ. It begins first with me before the very throne of God asking for mercy, asking myself for mercy because in the message today, you will hear terms like mercy, repentance even, forgiveness, reconciliation. All of these terms are synchronized together to understand what forgiveness truly is. They all are together synchronized to give us a total picture of what it means to speak of forgiveness because you cannot say forgiveness without speaking of mercy. 
And I'm going to talk about these things. So where does it begin? With you and I before God first. We are yet condemned by our own sins and transgressions. Each one of us are condemned to death unless repentance happens. That's one of the primary things about the message of salvation. We must repent. And again, repentance activates, activates forgiveness. And that's why repentance is always going to be on my lips. It's going to forever remain on my lips because it's all about repenting and repenting of attitudes and wrong frames of mind and negativity and all these things that what? That tarnish the human heart, that affect our thinking. We live where we think. What we think is where we live, what we are. We are what we think. That's not just some little cliche that sounds good. We literally are and will exhibit what we think, what's in our heart. But it begins with us. I want you to go to Romans 5. Romans chapter 5. It's ironic. I was browsing back through the sermons from last week and found out that Romans 5 was used in this lectern last week. Well, God must want Romans 5 to be covered because it was already in my sermon that I gave last week. And so here we come again to Romans 5. So God says, I want this repeated again today. It was in my notes. Romans 5, verse 6. For when we, and you could insert you, when we, or you, were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, notice that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, or judgment. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled, there's that word reconciled, uh, to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So you begin to see the word reconcile ties right in with forgiveness. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You one cannot separate that term and the word and the meaning of reconciliation with forgiveness because they're synchronized totally together. If you have become forgiven, if you have been forgiven yourself by God, then you have become reconciled to God in Jesus Christ. That's, that's, that's Paul's very plain. For Paul getting accused of not always being plain, that's as plain as anyone, Peter or John or any of the rest of them could have put it. It's very plain. We only become reconciled through and by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. And by the way, why could you be granted, why could you be granted repentance and forgiveness? He had mercy on you. God extended mercy. And because of that mercy, you are now forgiven. And you are now reconciled back to him. And that's why every time we sin, every time we sin, we know we have, we are to become reconciled again through repentance. Repentance is active. It keeps the Holy Spirit activated. Repentance, repentance, I say over and over. And the prophets that will come one day, the two witnesses, it's not a doubt in my mind, they're going to preach to the world for three and a half years to repent. It is at the center of the gospel message. And that repentance means repent that you may be what? Shown mercy and forgiven for your sins. We go to Romans 3. Paul there in Romans 3. You're already there in Romans 5. Romans 3. Romans 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption. There's your another salvation word. There's your another word, redemption. If you were to sit down and write on a piece of paper all the words that pertain to salvation, it would be many, many words. So you see this redemption word that is in Christ Jesus. All we're reading, brethren, is really simple and yet very profound. All things happen through and by Jesus Christ. All things pertaining to salvation happen to and by and through Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul always writes about. 
whom God, verse 25, set forth to be a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, notice that in his forbearance, he looked over, passed over our sins. That's what it says in the next few words, had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Is it any wonder it's called Passover? It's because our sins have been passed over. And why have our sins been passed over? Only through and by the grace and the mercy and the forgiving of our sins by him, Jesus Christ, that Passover lamb, and through and by his shed blood and sacrifice. And then you read in verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And again, it all comes through and by that faith and belief in Jesus Christ and what he is doing in our life. As a pastor teacher, and I'm called, and I understand that, my, my time one day will end on this earth, and I know that. And when you're 71 and all those who will hear it today and hear it on the webcast later, my life will come to an end one day. I understand that. And there will be a day come where I will no longer be able to preach the word because either through health issues or death. And so I understand as a minister of Christ now, just like Mr. Martin sitting here in front of me, we're called to proclaim his word. And as I do so, and looking at the clock, and not just the literal clock there on the wall, but the figurative clock. I'm looking at the figurative clock. The hands are ticking. The hands are ticking on my life, and they're ticking on your life. They're ticking on all of our lives. And it tells us there's work to be done. And we all should wear a sign, I think, on our body that says front and back, be patient with me, I'm a work in progress. I think we all should have that little sign to remind all of us to be forgiving to one another because when we transgress at times against one another, we need to be patient and understanding and forgiving. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. We become reconciled first to God and then to one another. I will repeat that. We seek first to be reconciled to God and then secondly to one another. And what are you saying, Pastor? Uh, that's observing the two great commands, to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is to love one another. There again is encapsulated and entrenched the whole essence of the whole law. And that is exactly, that is exactly what reconciliation means. We are to become reconciled first with God and then to reconcile with one another. You're here in 2 Corinthians 5. Drop down to verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled. There you see this word again. Has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has also given us the ministry of reconciliation. Brethren, what does that say to you? What does it say to your heart and your mind? Because we have been reconciled to God, as I said. We're told here by Paul again that we also have that ministry to be reconciled as well to one another. The body of Christ, the church, the ecclesia, the call out ones, whichever term you want to use, we have been called to become reconciled to God and one another. And it comes through repentance and being forgiven and God forgiving us and us turning around and forgiving others. Everything rests on those premises, those spiritual premises and principles. Verse 19, that is God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and not imputing their trespasses to them. And we know what that means. That means that our sins are not condemning us. Once we are forgiven, our sins do not condemn us any longer. And has committed to us, notice that, to us. Who is us? the disciples of Christ, the church, the body of Christ, has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Pass the word. Proclaim it from the rooftops. You have been forgiven. 
Go forth and forgive others. This is what's being talked about. Verse 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And again, as Glenn Holiday said last week, forgiveness is a godly trait. Again, righteousness is not ours. We don't own one piece of righteousness at all. We don't have ownership as such of one bit of righteousness. Any righteousness in us is from them. And it is deposited in us and only that through and by receiving forgiveness and mercy and also turning around and giving that forgiveness and mercy to others. And as I go along in the message, I will bring some of these things out more as I go along. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, I wonder playing with Kind of, kind of playing with your mind, your thoughts a little bit. Many of you know there's something in Matthew 6. If you know the Gospels pretty well, you may know where I'm going. Matthew 6. Give you a moment to get there. Matthew 6. We have here Jesus Christ given the model prayer. The model prayer. And every time I look at this, and I ask myself, did he mean what he said? Yes. He told us with an outline how to pray and what to pray for. Doesn't mean this is the only thing we pray about, but he gave us, in my mind, the most important things we pray for and pray about. And here it is. Read it along with me. Verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven. So we're told, pray to your Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. You are holy. You're the holy Father of the universe. Your kingdom come. Is that not what we're most of all praying maybe right now? Thy kingdom come to heal this mess down here on this earth that we see now? Your will be done, not my will. I've started to say more lately in anointings. And I remind me and all of us, even when you're physically anointed for something, you want to be healed, we all do. But pray thy will be done. Brethren, I say it clearly and boldly. You may be going through a physical trial that God wants to stay with you a while to teach you something. He did with Paul, remember. He wouldn't remove his affliction from him because he said, my strength, my grace is sufficient for you. It made Paul stronger going through the affliction. Thy will be done, not, my, not mine, not yours. I want this one to be in office in November. Guess what? Pray thy will be done because God's will is gonna be done. This presidential election that's upcoming, God's will will be done. I can assure all of us of that, whatever the outcome. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. What does the ultimate word bread really mean, signify in the spiritual sense? Who was the living manna? Jesus Christ. What's the lesson of the days of unleavened bread? Let this unleavened portion live and dwell in you. Imbibe of this unleavened portion always every day of our life. Give us this daily bread, the living man of Jesus Christ. Let Christ walk with you. Let Christ be in you. Let his mind, Philippians 2, 5, be in you and in your heart, shaping a new heart and a new mind. And then look what Christ goes to. And forgive us our debts. Well, we all understand what the word debts signifies. Forgive us of our sins, our transgressions. First against you. And then as we forgive our debtors, and he speaks of us then forgiving others. So you see, pray that your sins be forgiven. And aha, turn around and forgive others. Verse 13. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
And then Christ could have just left it at that, right? And Christ could have just moved on to lay up treasures in heaven starting in verse 19. He could have just jumped to that parable. But it's almost like, but I'll leave you with something more before he leaves this about how we pray. Verse 14, he drives the point home. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's not my words. That's Jesus Christ. When it's written in red, it was said long ago, it's written in red, pay close attention. If I don't forgive someone as I should and I'm told to do, I am not reconciled with God. The moment that I have a hardened heart not to forgive someone, and it doesn't matter who they are, if it's from the past, present, or when, if I don't forgive that person and I have a hardened heart of despisement, resentment, and these feelings and attitude, negativity, I am not reconciled with God. And that's what Christ is telling us all. If you don't forgive, you are not forgiven. Leave your gift at the altar, as the scripture says. I don't go there today because there's a whole lot I want to cover, and I'm watching that clock, and I always know that I'm not going to keep you sitting beyond the point of endurance, you know, on your backsides. Brethren, this is very serious business, very serious with all of us. Forgiveness is vital to our own salvation, and we all want to be forgiven by God. We all want forgiveness. But how often do we give forgiveness? How often are we willing to forgive someone? There's no qualifications. Well, Lord, do I have to forgive them? They've done me this great wrong. They haven't apologized. They haven't come back and said I'm sorry or anything. Yes, you've got a good excuse. Next one, next case. That's not how it works. Forgiveness, forgiveness is to be given because ultimately forgiveness represents you turning the hurt loose. You turning it loose because the great damage it does is to your own being and your own heart when you won't forgive someone. You're the one in bondage. You're the one trapped in your own enslavement by the fact that you won't forgive. I want you to turn, you're there already in Matthew Look at one verse, Matthew 5, 7. Matthew 5, 7. From the Sermon on the Mount, we call these people do the Beatitudes. Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What does that say to you and I? What does it say? What's Christ really saying? What does mercy really relate to? Mercy, again, relates to forgiving. You cannot separate mercy from forgiveness. If you forgive someone, you have shown mercy. We've been shown mercy by God forgiving us of our sins and transgressions through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And are we not very happy and joyous that we can be here today hopefully exonerated and we're not sitting on death row anymore? You were on death row, sitting on death row, facing death eternal, ultimately, if you don't repent, we have to repent and ask for that mercy. Where is the altar of mercy now? Where is the mercy seat right now? It's at their throne. Our prayers, as Revelation says, are not turning there. Our prayers are emptied there at the throne of God. Why? Because that's where the mercy seat is. We go to the throne of God and beg for mercy, ask for mercy, ask for forgiveness, and to become reconciled to God. And then we are what? We are redeemed. All these terms are so interchangeable when you talk about salvation. Repentance, redemption, reconciliation, reconcile, forgiveness, mercy, and more words could be invoked. We are pursuing salvation. That is the quest. That is, again, I will thunder it from the rooftops again. Philippians 2, 12, Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Not your neighbor, not your brother, not your sister. That's what we're all pursuing. We're all pursuing working out our own salvation with God and Jesus Christ. And as we become reconciled to them, we're told to also become reconciled 
to your brother, your sister, or whoever, because we're told by Christ, if you don't forgive, you're not forgiving yourself. I'll ask a very blunt question right now, very bold, blunt question. And when I ask this question, think about it for a moment before you may answer it in your mind even. Would you give haven and refuge to a murderer in your home? Would you harbor a murderer in your home? Think about that for a moment. I said a little bit earlier, you are what you think. What your heart, your mind, what dwells in you, who dwells in you, the way you process things, the way you process life, the way you process your calling, everything relates to what goes on in the human heart, signifying what goes on in your being. What are your attitudes? What are your feelings? We're all governed by emotions, and frankly, we all know that. We're more governed by our emotions most every day than we are by God in Christ, and we fight those emotions, do we not? We all have humanists. We're all human, and we fight the emotions that occupy our hearts and minds, and those emotions take us down avenues of negativity at times and unforgiveness and so many other things, self-desires, you name it. And yet God the whole time is telling us you're to become a washed, cleaned up vessel. You are to become clean and righteous and holy. Be ye holy as I am holy. And you find that in Peter's first letter there that I won't go to, taken from the Old Testament when God told ancient Israel, be ye holy as I am holy. That is always the quest is to become holy as he is holy. And an unforgiven nature is a godly trait that has to be passed from them to us and then embraced and to be lived by. Not just given lip service, but to live by. But could you be harder, harboring a murderer in your home? I want you to turn back to the Sermon on the Mount. You're already there, probably Matthew 5. Look at Matthew 5, verse 21. This is the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever given. Christ says here, Matthew 5, 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. That was by the letter. If you murdered someone, you were automatically judged, and if, it was, if you were murdered, you died. But I say to you, verse 22, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And I'll just stop there because you can read on later. Shall be in danger of judgment. What does it mean to be angry? It means what? I looked up the Strong's. I went back to the Greek, Strong's Concordance. I have a Thayer's Greek lexicon as well. They all say, it says the same thing. That word angry in the Greek simply means to despise to despise someone, to resent someone, to abhor someone, to be indignant against someone, to be vengeful, to be angry, to become exasperated with. Those are some of the definitions given in Strong's. If you're even angry to the degree that you despise someone, you have come to resent them, you have come to vilify them, condemn them, you have committed murder. That hits hard. Believe you me, brethren, I spent a lot of time in thought process and prayerful thoughts with this message. And I said, if it gets on toes to touch your heart, so be it. Go to 1 John. 1 John 3. 1 John chapter 3. The epistle... Those of us who put messages together and we put a message together and we're thinking, okay, where in the Bible can, can I use, where can I find that particular scriptures that really drive the points home that I'm trying to make? Well, boy, when I found this one, it, like it drove it home. 1 John 3. Let me begin. Let me begin here in verse 10. 1 John 3, 10. 
In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. You see that right away. He who does not love his brother. And what is part of that loving one another is to be forgiving of one another. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. These are strong, bold, powerful words from John. You know, talk about Ronald Reagan that time saying we're gonna paint in bold colors. John paints here in bold language and makes it plain. And then look at what he says in verse 15. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Wow. When I was doing the sermon preparation and went to that and went back and saw that again, wow. That's all I can say. Makes it clear, does it not? If you hate someone, and I've already given the definition of that from the Greek, you are committing murder. So you wouldn't harbor a murderer in your home, and yet you have a murderer's heart. These are not my words. These are not my words. These are right out of the word, his word. I want to mention something. As I prepared the message, I've looked at this council culture, this council, council culture that we have, and we see the last number of years and presently, we see the condemnation of many of our leaders of the past, our heroes of the past, tearing down our heroes of the past, going back to even our forefathers, even those men who signed the Declaration of Independence, all the way back to George Washington and vilifying many of our leaders because what they did or what they didn't do, judging them from our vantage point. And if you're not aware of that, then you must have been living under a rock, tearing down statues, desecrating them, counseling our own history, vilifying people from the past. You know, when I hear these things, I think, bless their hearts, they're dead in their grave and you're still wanting to what? Throw more dirt on top of them? They're dead. God will deal with every person that's ever lived. Every person that's ever lived. God, when he brings them up in resurrection, God and Christ are going to deal with them their way then. We don't have to concern ourselves with that. God's going to deal with them. And if they deserve reward, he'll give reward. If they deserve some judgments, he's going to give judgments. I don't even waste my mind's time thinking about that. I'll leave everyone to God's justice. But I thinking about that and the vindictive spirit that I see and the harsh condemning attitudes to even people from the past. We can't judge and don't have the rights in that sense in one way to say it. A 18th century man or person, you didn't live then. We didn't face some of the same issues they faced and they didn't face some of the issues we're facing. It comes down to, we're told to forgive. Turn it loose, that's what it means. Forgiveness, turn, we just turn it loose. Your, your former pastor, Dave Dobson, he had a good term for forgiveness. You, many of you will remember, Dave, Dave Dobson would say, take it back like to the back 40 and bury it. Whatever your grievance is, take it back in the back 40 so, and bury it. And don't do like Randy Travis' old country song, don't keep digging up stinky bones. Every time we dig up the grudges and the things of the past, it only is like stinky bones being dug up. Like I said, I should have given this around Passover because it's so crucial as we take that Passover every year and hold me to next year, maybe coming back to the Sermon on Forgiveness one this time that I will do maybe before we take the Passover. It is all, brethren, about becoming reconciled to God that is the first order, is for us to have repentant attitudes, to repent, truly repent, to obey God, to ask for his mercy. 
to ask for his grace, to ask for forgiveness. And once we receive that, to turn around and understand that because we didn't deserve it, did you deserve his forgiveness? Did we any of us deserve it? If we say yes to that, then we actually defy the logic, spiritual logic of scripture that says we were all undeserving of it because he truly did willingly lay his life down. He truly did. He loved us that much. And so if he loved us that much to give his life for us, why aren't we willing to forgive someone else? And forgiven doesn't mean you never think about it or forget about it. The heart that it heals is yours. You know, the title of the sermon is Forgiveness to Heal a Heart. Forgiveness, and it starts again with repentance. Repentance and forgiveness and mercy and reconciliation. It, it cleanses the being, the heart. And I use the heart so much because the heart represents the center of our being. It basically, if you study the term the heart, the heart, it, we're talking about the center of our whole being. That's why Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, the last book of the Torah as it's called, the last book that he wrote, Deuteronomy has the word heart mentioned in it more times put together than the other four books of the law put together because Moses came to understand before he died and he wrote that last book, Deuteronomy, it's all about what resides in the heart, what lives in us. That's why the new covenant is about what's written on the tablets of the heart, not something on the outside that we have to practice some ritual on the outside, whether it be tassels we wear or anything else. It's not about that. It's about what lives inside, as Paul speaks of, the new creation, the new man. That's what it's all about. We're new covenant Christians pursuing a new administration. The New Testament writings are full of these, this language. But you have to open the book. You have to read it, study it, ask God for his direction, his wisdom, his understanding. And if you do that and you pursue that with diligence, you will come to better understand God's mind and Christ's mind and become more like them. But it takes diligent study, prayer, and really processing repentance as we should. I want you to turn to Luke 4. Luke chapter 4. Just go right heart and core. Luke 4, Christ had fasted for 40 days and nights. He comes back to Nazareth. He goes into the synagogue. He reads from the book prophet Isaiah. If you know the whole story, after he read what he did and sat down, they thought about it momentarily and they're going to kill him because they knew what he was saying. He was announcing himself as the Messiah. But he says here, this is what he said when he stood up that day and read from the prophet Isaiah, he read a prophecy about himself. He announced himself to his own hometown. This is really what he did. And he said here, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He gave the preview of the ministry that he would do. This is what he did that day. He announced not only his ministry, but he announced this is what my ministry will look like. This is what I will do. And he did for three and a half years. I wrote in my notes, he came to heal the heart. He came to bring forgiveness of sin. He became the Passover lamb. He came to heal the broken parts. Where are we most broken? Your physical body right now, your physical body may be breaking down. And that's what happens when we age. And your physical body may be breaking down. It may be broken down. But it cannot touch your spirit. If your spirit is intact with God and him in you and working in you, and that spirit is healing you inside, it doesn't matter how broken the outside is. The thing that matters most of all and will count the most in the end is that we have those broken parts inside healed. And a broken heart and a contrite heart are so important to always remember. And he came to do what? He came to preach deliverance to the captives. 
He didn't go to prisons. He didn't go to jails and demand the magistrates to free these prisoners. That's not what he's talking about. It says he came to deliver the captives. What do you think he's talking about? He came to deliver men from bondage. The bondage when they're in bondage to sin and transgression. And when they're in sin and when they're in bondage to their own unforgiving hearts. Not forgiving puts us into a state of bondage. It enslaves us back again to wrong, anti-God attitudes. If you won't forgive, you're not forgiven, is what Christ said. He came to set at liberty those who are oppressed. I wrote in my notes, I wrote in my notes, an unforgiving spirit oppresses the heart and suffocates his spirit in us. An unforgiving spirit will ultimately, if not repented of, if we won't show mercy, then not only will we not become reconciled with God in Christ, but we're told cleanly and clearly that our own sins are not forgiven if we don't forgive. Brethren, I've, I've been speaking since 1989 in the church of God, and this is as plain and bold as I can make it today that I've ever made it about forgiveness. Because I still see at times and hear with my ears, even though I don't hear so good no more, but I still hear and see attitudes of unforgiveness in the body of Christ, and it should not be. It should not be. And he came to set us free from those things. There's no greater bondage, there's no greater bondage than to be trapped in resentment and anger, and despisement, and hatred. I wrote, I found something on the internet. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that that prisoner was you. Can't be better said than that. That prisoner is you or I if we harbor those kind of unforgiving attitudes and feelings. I want you to go to the Gospel of John, John 8, John chapter 8. In preparing the sermon, I knew as I started to put the notes together on the sermon, I knew that John chapter 8 had to be in the message because I love this, I love this scene here that happened with Christ and I thought this has got to be in the message about forgiveness. John chapter 8, let's start reading. I'll drop to verse 2. Early in the morning, this is, this, is actually, this is actually on the eighth day. They were there all going to the temple on the eighth day because we know when we read the previous chapter that they had been keeping the Feast of Tabernacles and it says here, and actually the opening of my chapter, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, but early in the morning, he came again to the temple and all the people came to him. Notice all the people, because it was the holy convocation time of the eighth day. And come by, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. It's like, we've got her. We caught her in the very act. And see, what was going on in their hearts and minds, they had been trying throughout his ministry to, in that sense, trap Christ, trap him, box him into the corner. Aha, we've got you on something. And they knew they had him now. They had him. Because the old covenant, the Old Testament law said, she is to be stoned. It was very clear, the law. And how's he going to get around this? And so they brought her to him, testing him. Verse five, now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? That's almost like in a mocking way. What do you say? Christ reads completely their attitudes. This they said, testing him that they might have something noticed of which to accuse him because they were constantly looking to find something to accuse him of. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. 
And I won't get into what he wrote and all that right now in this message. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, how powerful was this to them? He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. If one of you is not a sinner, has no sin, then cast the first stone. And it's not in the scripture, but imagine that really dumbfounded them. I can almost be in the moment seen and see the look in their faces when he said that. Are you without sin? If you are, cast the first stone. What are we also dealing here? You begin to see we're dealing with no mercy. They had no mercy. And that was the Pharisees' problem. They had no mercy. They had hardened hearts. The Pharisees had stony hearts. And that's what Christ addresses to them in another portion of Scripture that I won't go to. Verse 7. Well, I'm sorry, verse 8. And he, again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience, they went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Uh, I said last week, uh, using Southern speak, they slunk away. They, is, is slink the word? They slinked away. They departed almost to say in shame, their heads down. And they dropped the stones, no doubt, in their hands because he so convicted them. I, su I suggest in the moment, I suggest in the moment, they had already said very previously, long time previous to this day, that this man speaks with authority. No one has ever spoken with more authority on earth than Jesus Christ. Because it was said in the scripture that he spoke with great authority. And when Jesus Christ spoke, who could contradict Jesus Christ? And there's no doubt that when they walked away, they might have had the stone still in their hand, but they walked away and not a one of them cast one stone. And then we read the rest of the story. When Jesus, verse 10, had raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. That says a volume, does it not? That encapsulates the whole essence of the new covenant. You are forgiven. This is what he's telling her. I have extended mercy to you. You are forgiven, but repent and don't sin no more. I've often said over the many years, if that same woman played in the what if game, if the same woman had been brought back to Jesus Christ a second or third time, caught in adultery, I think we can all deduct that his counsel and his words would have been somewhat different, don't you think? But go and sin no more. He upheld the law. He upheld the law of God, his own law, because he was God. Go and sin no more. He showed mercy. He extended mercy and gave forgiveness. And he spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. There's a scripture in James 2, 13. You can jot it down. You can turn there if you want to. It's in James chapter 2, verse 13. A scripture that I have made myself so familiar with over the many years, and it fits totally into what Christ said that day to the woman and what all those observers heard him say. And James 2, 13 encapsulates and really gives us all the full spiritual principle of what Christ told the woman that day. For judgment is without mercy. Notice that. Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. They were willing to show the scribes, the Pharisees, and any of the other religious intelligentsia there that day, be it members of the Sanhedrin or whoever was there that day, none of them, because of their hardened hearts, were willing to show one ounce of mercy. This encapsulates James 2, 13, is this new covenant with better 
promises that we can receive mercy and that mercy comes through and by Jesus Christ, his shed blood, his sacrifice, and that prevails over judgment. Under the Old Testament law, those Pharisees knew they thought, as they quoted there, Moses' law, we've got you, Christ. She has to be stoned by the law. They were not ready for what he told them. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We all deserve judgment for our sins, but it is removed through and by what Christ did and what he is still doing. And again, judgment does not sit on top of our heads, so to speak. We are not under judgment so long as we live repentant lives. That's why Hebrews 10, 26 says, thought about it in a moment. Hebrews 10, 26 says, if we sin willfully, if we sin willfully after we have received that mercy in essence, that forgiveness, that grace, it says, then we are no longer receiving any mercy, grace, or forgiveness. When we sin willfully, which does lead to the unpardonable sin. Which does lead to the unpardonable sin. It's when we sin willfully. And I think most of us know, most of us as adults, most of us know when we sin, do we not? When we kind of mess up. I begin to wind the sermon and finish it. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, the story of Stephen. You could read the whole chapter 7 of Acts, Stephen's sermon that got him murdered, because that's what they did, they murdered him. But I want to drop down in chapter 7 of Acts. He's come to the end of the message that he gave the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief elders and probably the Sanhedrin council there, that all of them were probably there. And you start in verse 51. He's given them this message, and then he calls them out. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. He told them, and he called them, you murdered the Messiah. This is what he tells them. It's exactly what he told them. Who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed at him with their teeth. I always wondered, what does it mean to gnash? Does that mean they're popping their teeth? Uh, They were angry. Boy, they were angry. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God in Jesus standing at the right hand of God. The only place in Scripture that it speaks of Jesus Christ standing at the throne. It's the only place in Scripture in the Bible. And as the minister said long ago, and I have always believed the minister was right when he said it long ago in a message, it's like Christ has stood and he allows Stephen to look into the throne room and see Christ standing there saying, Stephen, you can do this, you can do this, encouraging him. And he said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Remember, they were going to stone him, Stephen, because he was preaching blasphemy. He was promoting this Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and that was the highest order of blasphemy and idolatry. And so they felt totally, and now here he says, I see Christ, the Son of Man, standing there. And look what they did. They cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. They even got madder. How dare you to say that you can see Christ, Jesus Christ, that man from Nazareth, as the Son of God? And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, which as we know was Paul later. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and he cried out with a loud voice. Look at this, what he said. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or he died. Do not charge them with this sin transgression, and what was the sin and transgression? They are murdering me. They are killing me. But do not hold it against them. Forgive them is what he is saying. Now that, as Glenn Holiday said last week, takes a godly trait in us, God in us to do. 
Without it, we can't. As the song said you heard, it's impossible without God. Forgiving someone in a situation like that is impossible without God in us. That's why you could go through a whole sermon about forgive your enemies. You can't forgive enemies unless you have God in you to enable you to be able to do that. Those who persecute you, it says. Again, you cannot forgive those who persecute you unless you have the godly trait and that spirit of forgiveness that comes from them that's dwelling in us. One last example. The best. The best example. The best example is Luke 23. Luke 23, starting in verse 32. Luke 23, verse 32. He's been crucified. He's hanging, that is Christ, on that cross stake, whatever you want to call it. And we know the two criminals were on each side, one on each side. Verse 32, Luke 23, there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. I rest my case. The Son of God, the very one who, yes, willingly came and loved us enough to lay his life down for us, and he said, and them having crucified him to death, forgive them, forgive them. That should serve as a lesson forevermore to each of us as we ask God to forgive us, that we turn around and extend the same mercy and grace and forgiveness to others. And I leave you with these words today as I close. If you're still holding one stone in your hand to cast at anybody in unforgiveness, then drop that stone. Drop that stone and become reconciled with God and Jesus Christ.